By now, you've had a few encounters with the goddess Artemis. Uh, you read about her, of course, in the textbook in Morford and Lenarden. Uh, you encountered her in the Iphigenia at Aulis by Euripides, and um, in a rather disturbing way in the Agamemnon of Aeschylus, where, as you recall, it's Artemis who demands the blood of Iphigenia, the sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter, in order to uh, end the uh, calm of the winds that has kept the expedition from sailing to Troy. And e even in this story, e even in the version that we have in Aeschylus, we're left with some bigger questions. Who, who is this goddess who, on the one hand, is so tender to the young of the uh, beasts of the field, and yet can demand the slaughter of a human being, the slaughter of Agamemnon's daughter. Uh, you'll, you'll remember that um, it's uh, in the Agamemnon we hear about uh, the way that uh, the, the Greeks pray that Artemis will not stick to what appears to be her uh, desire that since uh, a couple of eagles tore apart a pregnant rabbit that she's going to demand some great expiation of this. Uh, let me read you those lines. Um, I call upon the blessed healer that Artemis may not bring to pass delay in port through adverse winds, long-lasting holding fast the ships, working to bring about another sacrifice, one without song or feast, an architect of quarrels grown up with the family, with no fear of husband, for there abides, terrible ever again arising, a keeper of the house, guileful, unforgetting, wrath, child avenging. Uh, so the terrible prophecy, the terrible prediction that Artemis, angry at, strangely enough, um, simply an act of nature, which is, which is what birds of prey do when they uh, come upon a small animal that they want to eat, that because of this oddity, uh, she is going to demand the sacrifice of a human being. And Aeschylus goes on at some length about this, uh, reading here line 140 from the uh, Agamemnon, kindly as is the fair one to the helpless young of savage lions, and delightful to the breast-loving whelps of all beasts that roam the wild, she begs that these portents be made valid. In other words, that uh, the tearing apart of the hair will actually come true. Um, and it continues, favorable but not faultless are the signs. That's to say that Artemis will ultimately allow the expedition to sail but not without some terrible payment because of the anger she feels that the two eagles had destroyed the hair. We've talked already in the class about the strangeness of this cause that Aeschylus gives for the demand that Artemis levies for the sacrifice of Iphigenia. Uh, that's a point that we'll come back to later on so important for the understanding of the Oresteia. But for now, as we try to gain an understanding of Artemis and her seemingly conflicting roles, I, I want to pause on that inconsinity between the goddess that loves the young of all of the animals and the one who can at the same time uh, demand the sacrifice of the young girl. She is certainly a figure that has great appeal, both in antiquity and in modern times. A maiden, um, chaste, beautiful, uh, an accomplished archer, huntress, um, somebody who, as we just talked about before, is very tender to the young of animals, although she is a, a hunter um, and does certainly slay them. Um, again, you know, um, something that we need to understand to get the totality of the figure. This is a Roman copy of a statue, probably 
made during the fourth century BCE, and there you see Artemis with um, a young deer um, about to pull an arrow out of her quiver. And that, of course, is a tradition that goes all the way through centuries of art. Uh, this marvelous piece of bronze sculpture, which is in the National Gallery of Art here in Washington, alas, I can't take you on a tour of the National Gallery, given the epidemic. Um, but if you ever do get a chance to go there, you'll see this um, marvelous um, statue done by American sculptor Paul Manship. And there you see, again, the very athletic figure of Diana, uh, the Roman name for the goddess Artemis, um, turning as she runs to let loose an arrow uh, accompanied by a, um, apparently a wolf, a wild animal. Um, now what's a little unusual about this statue is that uh, Artemis is depicted here as largely naked. That's not something, as we'll see, um, is, that fits well with the actual classical goddess but I, I wanted to see this uh, extraordinary evocation of um, Diana or Artemis in 20th century art. I even see the Diana or Artemis figure uh, evoked in The Hunger Games as Katniss Everdeen uh, takes up her bow and arrow, which of course goes through all the various um, uh, episodes of The Hunger Games. Uh, you, you see that very classic pose uh, that is so evocative of the figure of uh, Artemis Diana. And in this uh, advertisement for uh, jewelry that uh, has the ability to summon help in the event of assault, uh, one sees again um, elements of the classical Artemis figure, um, beautiful um, and also chaste. Uh, this woman wearing Artemis jewelry is taking pains to make sure that she stays safe from any predator. Here are a few of the texts that you'll want to keep in mind in coming to understand Artemis, uh, not just the textbook description, but uh, Homer's description, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, Aeschylus, Agamemnon, which you've read, um, Euripides, Iphigenia, Aulus, uh, very interesting appearance in uh, Iphigenia and Taurus, another play that Euripides wrote about Iphigenia, and uh, of course Euripides, Hippolytus. A little bit of background about Artemis. Uh, she is the twin sister of Apollo. Uh, the mother um, uh, is Leto, um, beloved of Zeus. Uh, this was yet another one of Zeus's extramarital affairs. And Hera, uh, jealous and angry, uh, was trying to make sure that Leto would find no place on, on earth where she could actually give birth to the offspring of this um, illicit union with her husband. Um, finally, the floating island of Delos offered her a place, and um, she gave birth to Apollo and to Artemis, and uh, in, in return, uh, Delos became a, an island that was no longer floating, but a permanent island. Uh, so that's the Greek story. There are some very strong Near Eastern roots uh, in the figure of Artemis as we know it, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And here is the happy family itself. Um, you can see Apollo with his harp, and Artemis with her animals, and Leto, the mother of the twins. That on a 6th century BCE vase now in the British Museum. Let's look now at the strange combination of aspects that we find in the figure of Artemis. Uh, she is a goddess who um, looks after women in childbirth. Uh, of course, 
not every woman in childbirth, especially in the ancient world, survived. So she can either be the helper or perhaps even the um, the angel of death for a, a woman in childbirth. Interestingly enough, there's also a little bit of a um, tradition of her being a goddess that looked after fertility, uh, that being quite uh, at odds with another aspect of her reputation, which was um, an absolute virgin, um, someone who loved the chaste and the untouched. Listen, for example, to the speech that he delivers in Euripides' play, The Hippolytus, when he uh, weaves a garland for the, the statue of Artemis. Sovereign lady, lady most holy, offspring of Zeus, all hail Artemis, daughter of Leto and of Zeus, fairest by far of virgin maids, who in the broad heaven dwell in your noble father's halls, the richly golden house of Zeus, all hail, fair lady, fairest of the fair on Olympus. Mistress, for you I bring this garland I have woven, I fashioned it from flowers, in a virgin meadow where no shepherd dares to let his flocks graze, and the plowshare has not yet come. It is a pure meadow, and the bee passes over it in the spring. Reverence tends it with river water for all who have gained self-discipline in everything they do. No mortal man their tutor, but nature alone. Its flowers are for them to gather, while the wicked are prohibited. Dear mistress, permit a devoted hand to set this garland on your golden hair. For I am the only mortal who has this privilege. I am at your side. I talk with you and am answered, hearing your voice, but not seeing your face. Oh, may I end life's race as I have begun. In other words, also an absolute virgin. Artemis is the Potnia Theron, a, um, a, a name that is given to her already in Homer's Iliad, the mistress of the animals. And that means she is both as she was um, depicted in Aeschylus or Astia in the Agamemnon, somebody who loves the offspring, the tender offspring of the animals, but is also a goddess of hunting who slays animals with her arrows and is proud of her skill as a huntress. She can be quite vindictive, uh, as we're going to see in the, particularly in the story of Actaeon. And we can certainly see her um, as is pretty typical of all of the Olympian, Olympian gods taking rough vengeance when she has been crossed. In the Hippolytus, uh, Aphrodite uh, is offended by the militant virginity, the militant chastity of Hippolytus, uh, who scorns her and refuses to offer any kind of courteous greeting or sacrifice to her. And so she contrives his death. And Artemis, at the end of the play, as Hippolytus is dying, says this, Not even in the darkness of the earth below shall it go unpunished, this willful anger of the goddess Cypris, that's um, Aphrodite, that attacks your body. This much I owe to your piety and righteous heart. With these unerring arrows shot from this hand, I will take revenge on another, one of hers, whatever man she loves most on earth. Now, in Homer's Iliad, Artemis doesn't cut much of a figure, nothing like the figure that we see in Greek tragedy or indeed in Greek art. Um, when the battle is raging uh, in front of the walls of Troy um, and the gods themselves are in collision with one another, Artemis scolds her brother Apollo for not fighting against Poseidon and protecting the Trojans. Um, and uh, Hera, who of course hates the Trojans and is uh, backing the Greek army, uh, gets really annoyed at Artemis and says this to her. How can you think to face me, you shameless bitch? A hard enemy I'll be for you, although you carry a bow and Zeus has made you a lioness to women. You have leave to put to death any you choose, no matter. Better to rend wild beasts on mountainsides and woodland deer than fight a stronger goddess. If you want lessons in war, then you can learn how I excel you, though you face me. She took hold of the wrists of Artemis in her left hand, and with her right hand she snatched her quiver and bow and boxed her ears with them, smiling to see her duck her head as arrows showered from her quiver. Artemis ran off in tears, 
as a wild dove attacked by a diving hawk will fly to a hollow rock, a narrow cleft where she cannot be taken. Taken So weeping, she took flight and left her bow. Then Hermes, the wayfinder, said to Leto, I would not dream of fighting you, so rough seem the cloud master's wives and fisticuffs. No, you may make your boast quite happily to all the immortal gods that you have beaten me. Leto retrieved the bow of Artemis and picked her arrows up where they had veered and landed in a flurrying of dust. Then she retired with her daughter's weapons. Artemis reached Olympus, crossed the bronze dorsal of Zeus, and at her father's knees sank down a weeping girl, her fragrant gown in tremors on her breast. Her father hugged her, asking with a mild laugh, "'Who in heaven injured you, dear child? Pure willfulness, willfulness, as though for a naughty act.' To this the mistress obeying Pax, her hair tied back, replied, "'Your lady Hera buffeted me, father, she of the snow-white arms, by whom the gods are plagued with strife and bickering.' A really amusing, charming portrait here of um, a, a little bit of discord in the divine family. But notice that although Homer clearly acknowledges that she is the huntress, um, that she can um, bring death to women, obviously women in childbirth, or, or to animals, um, she is not of the stature to fight with the other deities when they take their sides, take favorites on the fields before the, the, the walls of Troy. Now again, um, building from what we saw in the Agamemnon, where she demands the blood of Iphigenia, rather chilling, horrifying demand uh, that this patroness of small animals, of the young, of the beasts of the field, would demand the blood of a a young girl. Um, But we find her in other bloody rituals. Um, There's the ritual of Artemis, Orthea, and Sparta, um, when boys are flogged um, around the altar, later it becomes almost a spectator event in antiquity, um, and obviously their blood flows. Then there's a very strange ritual of Artemis Tauropolis, um, that it was practiced in Attica, where blood is taken from the throat of a man at the altar. Th- this ritual is described in the... Euripidean tragedy, um, Iphigenia among the Taurians, and here we have Athena describing the altar. When you come to Athens, that God-built city, there is a place on the furthest verge of Attica, opposite the ridge of hills above Charistus, a holy place. My people call it Halai. There build a temple and set up the image, naming it after the Taurian land and the troubles which you endured as you wandered over Greece, driven by the Furies' stings. She's speaking, of course, to Orestes. So for all future time, men shall sing to Artemis as Artemis Tauropolis and establish the following custom. When the people sacrifice at her feast, in compensation for the sacrifice she missed in you, in in other words, uh, this is the alternate legend of Iphigenia that she was miraculously rescued at the last moment from being sacrificed, uh, th- that you read about in the end of, uh, that you did read about at the end of Iphigenia at Aulis by Euripides, uh, and recall that Roman fresco where um, a deer is um, up in the heavens about to come down to the altar where where Artemis is to be sacrificed, where Iphigenia is to be sacrificed. Um, So at any rate, to continue um, the speech, so for all future time, men shall sing to Artemis as Artemis Tauropolis and establish the following custom. When the people sacrifice at her feast in compensation for the sacrifice she missed in you, let the priest apply the sword to a man's neck and draw blood for purity's sake and pay the goddess honor. So blood for blood, there's a a strange, strange um, strand, a strange thread in the cult of Artemis. Now hold these thoughts in mind. I'm going to try to pull these strands together as we try to understand the classical figure of Artemis and where it came from.
I spoke of the goddess's vindictiveness, uh, this not surprising for an Olympian deity. Uh, she and her brother Apollo took terrible vengeance uh, against Niobe, who had boasted that she had seven sons and seven daughters, whereas Leto, the mother of Apollo and Artemis, had only two. Well, you don't say something like this and expect that there are not going to be consequences. Here in a painting by Jacques-Louis David, um, we see Niobe crying out uh, against Apollo and Artemis uh, sitting on their clouds as they rain death upon her sons and daughters. The story is quite ancient. It's already told in Homer's Iliad. Uh, and it, it is in classical times a, um, a, a warning story about hubris, about um, boasting and insulting the gods. Interesting that Niobe is the daughter of Tantalus, um, who you remember uh, thought that he could serve his son Pelops to the gods and that they wouldn't detect it and he could get away with this uh, grievous insult to the deities. It's a figure, it's an um, image that is often seen in ancient art. Here, a haunting sculpture from the Hellenistic age um, as the dying child uh, embraces her mother, who's turned into a rock that forever drips water in her perpetual weeping. And here we have the depiction on a Greek vase uh, now in the Louvre at Paris, 5th century BCE, and you see the twins, uh, Artemis uh, a little bit to the left of center, Apollo to the right, uh, calmly shooting their arrows and uh, killing the children uh, with a certain um, kind of poised um, coldness uh, as they take their vengeance against Niobe's hubris. And now we come to a story that's already familiar to you. We looked at this particular vase right at the very beginning of the semester. Actaeon um, dies for uh, different causes, uh, told differently by different um, authors. But the mainstream version, uh, the one best known, is that he stumbled upon Artemis as she was bathing, as she was naked. And um, given her... Uh, total uh, commitment to chastity, she was so offended that she um, turned Actaeon into a deer, into a stag, um, so that he was torn apart by his own dogs. But interesting to see that there were different versions, um, not just the, the well-known story of uh, coming upon her bathing, but a different kind of hubris, boasting that he was a better hunter than Artemis, uh, and just as Niobe, who boasted that she was a better mother than Leto, um, he pays for that crime. Uh, in another version, um, he courted Semele, who was um, also had also caught the eye of Zeus, so Zeus just dispatched him. I want to return now to the story of Iphigenia, which we've been raising uh, th throughout this, this particular discussion. Uh, as you know, in, um, in the Agamemnon, a very puzzling kind of um, rationale given for um, Artemis' demand of the blood of Iphigenia. Um, another version is given to us in Sophocles, um, which is perhaps a little more comprehensible that Agamemnon had killed an animal in her sacred grove and then was foolish enough to boast about the kill. That seems more in keeping uh, with what would anger a goddess and uh, cause her to, to take revenge, even though the revenge is a particularly ho horrific one. Uh, another version, this one given in Euripides' Iphigenia among the Taurians, is that Agamemnon, like Jephthah in the Bible, had said, I'm going to sacrifice, in Jephthah's case, the first thing that comes out of my house, or in Agamemnon's case, the most beautiful thing that the year produced. Uh, and in both cases, they wind up having to sacrifice a child, a daughter. <laughs>
But then, as we talked about before, there is an alternative version in which she doesn't really die, that a deer is substituted. Uh, there are some other versions that we're going to talk about in a moment where some different animal is substituted. I want you to keep in mind this issue of a sacrificial animal substituted. And um, we find in the Iphigenia uh, among the Taurians, which is uh, also written by Euripides, um, there she is, she's been rescued, and she's become a priestess of Artemis in Taurus, where she presides over human sacrifices. This is a theme that's woven into this story. Either she dies or um, she herself becomes a priestess that consecrates um, the poor strangers that wander into the Taurian land to a bloody human sacrifice. And Iphigenia pours out her heart um, when she she loathes the role that's been thrust upon her, and she says, if someone stains his hand with human blood, or touches a corpse, or even a woman giving birth, she, that's Artemis, bars him from her altars, since she considers him polluted. However, she herself takes pleasure in human sacrifices. It's impossible that Zeus and Leto could have produced so perverse a child. My view is that the people here, murderers of men themselves, impute their own bad deeds to the goddess, for I think that none of um, what the goddess does is evil. H.J. Rose, who wrote a very good handbook of classical mythology, had this to say, and it begins to help us narrow in on understanding the complex figure of Artemis. I realize we've moved from the... Um, athletic, huntress, um, chaste goddess to something really more, much more nuanced, much more complex. That, as you know by this point in the semester, is pretty typical when we really begin to do the archaeology of understanding Greek myths. Well, what H.J. Rose says is, Iphigenia is not a goddess, but a princess of epic story, although not in Homer. Yet a princess who is constantly in association with um, a goddess as a victim, protege, or priestess, whose name is a title of that goddess, as Hesychius and Pausanias, two Greek authors, assure us, and who is variously stated to have substituted for her a hind, a bear, or a bull. All creatures associated with Artemis um, can hardly complain if she is suspected of being herself no other than the deity in question. So, Capture that thought and hold it for a moment, that Iphigenia, uh, the victim, is in fact another manifestation of the goddess herself, and ask why. Well, H.J. Rose goes on to also add that there was another version, presumably Attic, according to which the sacrifice was not at Aulus, but at Brauron in Attica, forgive me these typos, and the substitute for the sacrifice was a bear. So we can have a deer, a bear, or a bull, and all of them having a certain cultic correspondence with Artemis. Um, so let me begin to introduce the idea that there's a certain unity of goddess, of victim, um, and of worshiper. And that seems to become even more pronounced in the strange story of Callisto. Pausanias tells the story, although it's, it's referenced much earlier in Greek literature, Pausanias, second century of the Common Era, um, Euripides in the fifth century BCE. She's a favorite nymph and a companion of Artemis, but Zeus, who's disguised as Artemis, seduces her and leaves her pregnant. Artemis discovers her companion has been unchaste. She can't stand anything like that. So in one version, Artemis turns her into a bear. Um, notice before that we uh, saw a ritual at Brauron where Iphigenia um, is saved and the substitute animal that's sacrificed is a bear. In another, it's jealous Hera, who's angry again that 
Zeus has taken a mistress, and therefore she wants to persecute the mistress. Um, and in that story, uh, poor Callisto, turned into a bear, is almost shot by her son, Artemis, who's out hunting. Uh, and in that version, with a happy ending, they both become constellations, or as the Greeks would say, they are catastrophized. The uh, story of um, Callisto's seduction is uh, obviously a, a naughty story that attracted the attention of artists uh, from antiquity onward. Uh, this one by uh, Angelica Kaufman, um, 18th century, um, shows a very beautiful um, uh, uh, Jupiter in disguise um, in the green dress, uh, looking ever so much like Artemis. Um, trying, uh, trying rather successfully to seduce um, Callisto. And here we have this scene by Francois Boucher, um, Jupiter, otherwise known as Zeus in the Greek um, mythology, um, here seducing Callisto. And the very famous artist Titian had a crack at the story as well. Uh, here, uh, Artemis, or Diana, has discovered that um, poor Callisto has a swollen belly and is about to um, exile her from the troop of her followers of her nymph. The story is quite ancient. Here we see in a 4th century BCE uh, fragment of a Greek vase, um, there is Callisto uh, in the process of being turned into a bear. In the story of Orion, um, we have uh, Artemis killing him um, either because he tried to rape her um, or um, because the goddess Dawn um, was in love with him um, or in one version, um, it's Gaia, the earth goddess herself, who um, kills Orion, the great hunter, because he boasted he would kill all the animals. Uh, what we're seeing here is the theme of Artemis as huntress, largely, um, that is, is surfacing, as well as her protection of her own chastity. And we come now to a very strange figure, uh, Artemis, uh, Artemis of Ephesus, Ephesus um, in now in modern-day Turkey. Um, here we see the Asiatic uh, influence in the figure of Artemis, very deep. Um, and this figure is often used as um, evidence. Your um, uh, textbook, uh, Morford and Lenarden, claims that it's a, um, it's a way that shows that Artemis also had uh, elements of an earth um, deity, uh, a fertility deity. But I want you to take a quick look at those protuberances, uh, take a good look at the protuberances on her chest. Are they breasts? Um, well, Walter Burkert has argued uh, rather convincingly that uh, what seems to be here is a hunting figure of Artemis uh, against whom the... Um, scrotum of bulls um, were hurled. So, in fact, we're getting, again, more of the huntress, more of the mistress of animals than any real fertility deity, although there is a fertility strand, as we saw, that Herodotus had mentioned, although not a particularly strong one. Now, the Near Eastern cult clearly might have had elements of fertility in it, but at least this statue is not a particularly good piece of evidence um, for a cult of um, Artemis as an earth mother. Let's now try to pull the, the different threads together and see if we can come up with an understandable portrait of Artemis and how she develops something that I've occasionally referred to as the archaeology of Greek mythology, not just these wonderful stories that are told in terms that we mortals can understand, um, stories of uh, 
arrogance and its punishment. Um, stories like the Oresteia, which bring up great human truths of escaping from cycles of vengeance. Um, myths that have grown into the, the gorgeous world of Greek literature. Um, but dig down deeper to the, the origins of where these figures come from. A hunter, as Walter Burkert has reminded us, drawing on works um, of Carl Moyley and other anthropologists, a hunter fears more than anything else the depletion of the animal supply. He wants his hunt to be successful, but there's always a little anxiety built in. Hence, not surprising that epithets like pytotrophos, the um, the, the nourisher of the child, Kurotrophos, the same thing. Um, these are epithets that the huntress Artemis shares with fertility goddesses like Demeter and Gaia, and indeed with her own mother, Leto. So two faces of the hunter, the um, success in shooting the animals, hunting them down, and the cultivation of animals, um, that comes from the anxiety of um, the possibility of them not being there. And these rituals go back all the way to the Stone Age. Uh, Walter Burkert um, notes the uh, dedication of the horns and the skin of the animal um, as if to say, please let these animals come back to life or at least let the animal supply never, never disappear. And one of the ways that can be expressed um, is in the identification of the goddess, the worshiper, and the victim, in other words, the hunted. And that what seems to be so utterly clear in the story of Callisto. Uh, in fact, we have a cult title of Artemis, a temple built to her, the Temple of Artemis Callisto. So there absolutely clearly we have the goddess and we have her devotee. And indeed, even in a ritual that we know about, um, Athenian girls would pretend in this ritual of Artemis that they were bears. And please remember too that um, in one of the cults of Artemis, as H.J. Rose um, mentions, the um, substituted animal is a bear. And remember, too, H.J. Rose's very provocative idea that we could suspect that in the Iphigenia story, she's not the victim, at least in the, in the archaeology of that story, when we get back to the, the earliest levels of the cult of Artemis, that Iphigenia is simply a manifestation of Artemis. Um, we see her in classical literature, Iphigenia, as the victim of Artemis. But at that oldest level, just as in the story of Callisto, the victim, the worshiper, and the goddess are all manifestations of the same. Now, why would this be? Uh, think back again to the idea of anxiety and guilt, especially in a hunting culture. Um, worry that the animal supply will diminish. Uh, deep inside that is the idea that the predator um, and the prey actually are manifestations of the same thing. And with it, in a very, very primitive way, um, a certain type of hope that the goddess is not going to die, um, nor is the animal supply going to die out, that uh, there's a cycle here that will always be repeated and the goddess will always live, um, as will the animal supply. Hence, we have this uh, phenomenon that we've seen before, um, evocative stories, the story of Iphigenia, uh, story of her father's terrible decision, um, Callisto, um, 
story of Zeus's lust and the goddess's anger. Um, this is the shimmering, gorgeous world of the classical myths as we have them. But I invite you, as before, to dig deeply and to think hard about some of these very odd elements that um, different version of the Iphigenia story that it's a bear that's substituted, not a deer, deer, and that Callisto is turned into a bear. And Athenian girls uh, participate in a ritual in which they say that they were bears. Um, all of this reminding us that um, what is given to us as literature in the world of classical mythology has much older and deeper roots that take us to some of the most subliminal, deepest levels of the human condition, uh, namely how we deal with the, the animal supply around us, how we deal with nature.